Hi there, we're joined today by Angela Davies and Dion Watson from CSI Training Events, and we're going to talk to you about careers in crime scene investigation. So ladies, thank you for joining us today. Um, we want to talk to you really about how you become a CSI. We both studied at Teesside University. We studied a degree in crime scene science, and after that we were lucky enough to go on to work for Northumbria Police straight after. Northumbria Police were taking on graduates at the time, um, straight from the Teesside degree. Um, so yeah, we applied and luckily both got positions. So. Fabulous. And is, it, is university the only route to getting into crime scene investigation? No, there are a number of different routes, aren't there? Yeah, there's a number of different ways and it it's it's hard because that's one of the questions we get asked quite often actually how how do you become a crime scene investigator and we always feel like we give quite a vague answer for this but it's because it changes from police force to police force and year on year it changes so some police forces do look for someone to have a degree in a relevant field so either crime scene science like we had or a forensic degree but they'll also accept, depends on the time, they can take as little as five GCSEs, including your English, maths and a science. And from there, they will do some in-house training. So it really just depends on the police force at the time, what it is that they, they're looking for. So it's a bit of a vague one, really, isn't it? Yeah, like they said, there's different entry requirements nationally. So, um, but it... it it is good to have a scientific background, whether that's at GCSE, A level or up to degree level, we would always advise to have a scientific background. And as well, if you can kind of have, have a keen interest or get qualification in photography as well, that'll also stand people in really good stead because as a scene investigator, you need to be able to work your way around a camera really well, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's we really chose, interesting. We chose the degree route, so we went to Teesside and uh, absolutely loved it. We were really fortunate I think because our lecturers a lot of them were practitioners so they'd um, they'd all worked in the field whether it was as scene investigators or forensic scientists so we were getting kind of real world knowledge from them and absolutely loved it because the stories and the anecdotes that they brought to their teaching kind of really um, helped hit home so I think that's one of the things if if you're interested in going to university I would definitely recommend looking for a course that is both um, taught by academics and practitioners, uh, but also to look for courses that are, that have been, um, sorry, I can't remember the word I'm looking for. Accredited. Accredited, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chartered Society, Ch Chartered Society of Forensic Sciences. Um, but yeah, I think the practitioner learning really, really helps a lot. And it's what we're trying to do with a lot of the things that we're doing now with our, with our CSI workshops and educational workshops. We bring that kind of real life learning and experience into the classroom. That sounds awesome, brilliant, thank you. Um, you mentioned two different degree courses there, one on, was it crime scene and then one on forensic science? Are they two different areas? What's the difference between those two? Yeah, so there's quite a big difference. And I think through things you see on TV, like CSI and things, they, they tend to do everything in the one job role, but they're actually very different. So a crime scene investigator is someone who will go to the crime scene and examine the scene to gather the evidence that's there. A forensic scientist is someone who actually mostly, they do sometimes come to crime scenes, but they're more lab based and they'll have a specialist subject that they study in particular. So they might look at, they might be a biologist and they'll look at blood patterns and that sort of thing. Or it could be someone who does more of the chemistry side and they'll deal with kind of toxicology and drugs, that side of it. So there's actually a very big difference between the forensic science side and the crime scene investigation side. And it depends really what you're kind of most interested in because it's yeah. very different going out and attending scenes and working, working at crime scenes and being public face in dealing with victims of crime every day to what it, what it is working in a laboratory. So some people love being kind of in the laboratory in that very practical, methodical way of working. Some people love to be, you know, attending crime scenes and having that interaction with the public. It's also still very methodical and logical working, but in two very different environments. So it depends really um, where your interest mostly lies. Okay, 
Brilliant. So what would you say that um, a good CSI, what kind of skills would that person have? Oh. So, lots, isn't there? Yeah, <laughs> lots of different ones. Um, but there's some key ones, I would say, common sense. We always say if you've got common sense, you can be a crime scene investigator. Sadly, sometimes common sense is not that common. <laughs> it really is not. <laughs> not I don't want yeah. to say that, but I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's probably actually probably number one of the skills that you have to have because that's one of the ones that it doesn't matter if you've been to uni or anything that's not something you can be taught really common sense is something that you've kind of got it or you haven't yeah definitely okay so yeah you need common sense um you need to be I think you just mentioned being methodical and logical it's a very um kind of sequential process that you work through at a crime scene so you need to be quite detailed and quite methodical in your approach to work and the way that you do things so you need to be organized and have kind of good time management skills as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, i think another one of the big ones is observation skills isn't it yeah so <laughs> Um, obviously, if you're examining a crime scene, you've got to be to observe your environment and be to realise what's what could be potential evidence, what looks out of place, that sort of thing. So you, you need to be really good with your observation skills. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah, sounds, uh, sounds like a good set of skills in general, doesn't it? Full bunch. It is. It's just to be honest, it's um, it's those key transferable skills that can't be taught, like they said. Um, that, that can be applied in crime scene investigation. There's a lot that you can be taught in house and a lot that you can learn, but those kind of key life skills like time management, prioritizing your workload, observation skills, that kind of thing, they, they come with practice and you can, you, you can um, learn them over time. Mm -hmm. um, another one that I was just thinking about, you, you do need to be a certain kind of person. So you need quite a strong stomach because you do see quite a lot of Hmm. gruesome things and quite a lot of horrible things at times um so you need quite a strong stomach because sometimes the smells are not so good either yeah um, and you've got to um be able to detach from work sometimes and not take it home i know that's similar for quite a lot of people that work in the front line and deal with this kind of thing but it's important to be able to detach from your work and what you're doing otherwise um it, it can be quite impacting Mm -hmm. you, like say you see some awful things and what happens is you tend to develop quite a dark sense of humor so a good sense of humor which can probably turn into a dark sense of humor is always a good a good thing to have because it's it tends to be a coping mechanism yeah sometimes crime scene investigators laugh at things that people will probably think is <laughs> a bit close to the board but uh, <laughs> it's just a way of coping yeah no I, I can i can appreciate that i understand that as well um Okay, so you've just kind of hinted at some of the slightly gorier details. Um, can you maybe talk a bit more about what you can physically see in that role and, and what people, if they're interested, maybe need to be prepared for? Yeah. So you, as a scene investigator, you, well, it actually depends on what level you're going at. There are different levels of crime scene investigation. So you could be a volume crime scene investigator, which means that you would attend things only like... Um, thefts from vehicles, burglars, burglaries to homes, that kind of thing. Or if you are a full crime scene investigator, it means that you effectively attend every type of crime scene. So you will attend those volume crimes that we just mentioned, but you'll also then attend um, what we call serious category crimes or major crime, which includes things like murder, robbery, kidnap, serious assaults, that kind of thing, um, where things do start to get a little bit more, a little bit more um gruesome is gruesome the word or what it is really gruesome. isn't it <clears throat> yeah so you you see pretty much the full range and you do see a lot of um dead bodies and one of the key key parts of the role is to attend post-mortems so you, you right. have to attend forensic post-mortems where a body is kind of dissected to find out the cause and manner of death and you play a role in that post-mortem whether that's as a photographer or a note taker or sample recover, uh, recovering samples you do play a part with the the pathologist and the rest of the team in the post-mortem so right. but the thing about that is if you can stomach it they are so so 
so interesting. You learn so much about the human body mm -hmm. and kind of working through and establishing the cause and manner of death is, I personally thoroughly enjoyed it. Not that somebody had died, of course, but thoroughly enjoyed the process of post-mortem and kind of establishing how somebody had died and why. Yeah. So interesting. So, so interesting if you can stomach it. I think, like you say, it takes away kind of the, the gruesomeness because your kind of interest takes over and those sort of things, doesn't it? Because it's, it's not the sort of thing that everybody gets to see and it is, it's it's fascinating to see really. And I think that takes over from you seeing it as a gory thing, more of an interest thing mm -hmm. at that point. I suppose it sounds a little bit like um, like detective work as well. Um, if you're trying to to define the, the cause and the manner of death, then you're then part of that bigger criminal uh, hunt for justice, for want of a better word, um, <laughs> and being able to put those pieces together. Obviously, the police rely on people like yourselves and uh, and others to try and put those pieces together. So, it's... well, it, yeah, it, and it's a, it's a big team effort, to be honest. When it's that, particularly when it comes down to major category crime, um, the, there's a whole team. So you'll have what you call an SIO, who's a senior investigating officer, which will normally be a detective from CSS, from CSI, from CID. Um, and he'll let, there'll be a team of detectives as well. And obviously you'll have the forensic pathologist, the mortuary technician, the CSIs, but you'll also um, potentially have a crime scene manager or a crime scene supervisor there. And then samples will get sent off for forensic analysis as well. So it'll be the forensic scientists doing their part in the, in the lab. So it becomes a big collaborative effort. So to, back to those key life skills like teamwork, and communication is really essential because you're all playing your, in your, your part in what you do. So we attend a scene and recover evidence, but then we need to kind of think about the evidence that we've got and also the police and what information they've got and what we can do with that evidence to get the best outcome. So what's going to drive the investigation, what evidence we're going to got, get that are going to help with the points to prove in the case that CID are kind of trying to prove alongside what evidence they have that makes sense so it, it is a real collaborative effort you have to say one of the other skills as well is being able to work on your own um a lot as a csi because we're talking here about teamwork and there is a lot of it involved particularly as i say when you're dealing with major category crime but when you deal with that volume crime and you're going to burglaries and you're going to thefts from vehicles the csi works pretty much solo so they work on their own a, a lot on a daily basis so mm -hmm. you've got to be good um, working, as I say, on your own, but using your own initiative as well and managing your own workload and prioritising that load as well. Is that quite a, a lot of pressure then if you're working on those volume crimes and working alone? Because obviously, presumably, there's only you or one or two others who are gathering that information. Um, is, that, is that stressful or is it just kind of part of the job? I think it can be if you let it be if that makes sense um because within within the job one of the things is you have to be really adaptable like Ange says you you're working by yourself a lot so you could come into work one morning and there could be just one or two jobs on and you could be on with a few other people or it, it could be as few as you and one other person on it just depends on the shifts and the days um and it could be that you go out with just one and you think actually this is a quite a quiet morning and you think you're going to catch up with some of your paperwork that you've got going on or something in the background but actually at any point in the day either more jobs can come in more volume crime or a major investigation can come in and then you have to be really adaptable to look at kind of your workflow that you had for the day um, and prioritize so you have to look at and think okay if a certain job there's a potential of losing some evidence added if it's outside for example you would have to prior prioritize that over something that's quite secure so you have to be quite adaptable and think on your feet with it so mm -hmm. at times it could be stressful if it's particularly if you had a really busy day but it's um it's rewarding at the same time isn't it so you kind of yeah you yeah. don't think of it as stressful whilst you're doing it you just get on with it if that makes sense i think the other thing is as well is that when you first start the job it's like anything you you're always a bit more nervous and a bit more cautious so if you were the only scene investigator on at the start of the day 
and for the first hour or two um, and there's quite a lot of jobs on then it can be become overwhelming and stressful as you become more experienced like say with any job role you just take it in your stride and things become like second nature to you and you handle things pretty quickly and and and, and deal with things you know effectively whereas maybe at the beginning when you first start out it is a little bit more stressful and you like say you are a bit more more cautious I guess mm. and it can be a bit more overwhelming but it's practice okay I suppose then taking from what you've just said there that no two days are the same does that sound about right for that type of role yeah and that's one of the best things about crime scene investigation work seriously yeah. like, not only are no two days the same sometimes like from hour to hour things change and that's the absolute beauty of it so you can go out with a list of jobs and you think okay I've got couple of burglaries or theft from vehicle and I'm going to go in this order and you know why you're doing it in your order you kind of plan it all out um, and then a murder will come in or a robbery will come in or a suicide will come in and suddenly or a couple of things will come in all at once and that massively impacts your day and you're like okay now I've got to change things up mm-hmm. and that that is the beauty of it no no two days the same you never know what's going to happen or come in and if you like that kind of work and that kind of pressure it's brilliant for that Mm. I used to find it uh, quite exhilarating when the day changed significantly Mm. I I really enjoyed it and I would thrive in that and often thrive working under pressure so particularly if a major scene were to come in I actually find that a lot of crime scene investigators if a major crime scene comes in they'll be crawling all over each other and fighting to get to it (laughs) If there's a bottom on the go, like people are fighting to get there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because it comes, it's different to your, your day-to-day jobs, isn't it? Because your, your day-to-day jobs aren't murder and things like that. Your day-to-day really are the, the burglaries, the thefts from motor vehicles, that sort of thing. So it's the, the volume crime that we were talking about before. But mm-hmm. even with any volume crime, to be honest, no two burglaries are ever exactly the same you'll never get exactly the same sort of evidence and you'll probably you'll examine it slightly differently depending on the circumstances so mm-hmm. like you say the days are different but even job to job is very different as well which is brilliant and the other thing that makes it different in, and like you were saying even not two burglaries, burglaries will be the same is the people because you have to remember you're dealing with victims of crime mm-hmm. so some People take things in their stride. Other people become very di- distressed. Um, we can have vulnerable victims, which uh, has a massive impact. So the, the people that you're dealing with also has a significant impact on how each job will go as well. So that's another key skill. You've got to have good people skills. You've got Definitely. to be able to on all levels because you can go from um, being part of a major investigation team and talking to a super invest super. super superintendent sorry or somebody from CID so you're talking to police level police officers high up in the organization to then talking to um, the public from all different backgrounds and all different walks of life to then talking to and dealing with offenders as well in custody so you need to be able to communicate on so many different levels and adapt and change how you communicate to be effective in your role and be able to get the evidence that you need sometimes. Mm. Sounds fascinating, ladies. It really does. I'm, I'm, I'm hooked. Sign me up. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a brilliant career path for anyone, I would say. Yeah. Agree. Okay. Um, so I suppose just to, to take a sidestep from the skills and the experiences, um, is it like the tele programs? <laughs> No, no. <laughs> big big shakes of heads. No, 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 no. no. We get asked that question so much, don't we? Yeah, we get asked it a lot, and it actually impacts your job massively as well because you you can go to a crime scene and someone loves CSI, so they'll kind of follow you, follow you around, and they just want to watch everything that you're doing, which that that's fine. But then you can go to the other side of where they've watched that much CSI that they think they know how to examine a crime scene more than you do mm-hmm. which that's an interesting one when they start asking you why you haven't examined a certain thing or they've seen on CSI that you can 
fingerprint a brick was always one of my favorites yeah. <laughs> or fingerprint eggshells I've also had um so they can they can be really confused over why you haven't done something that they've seen on the tv that mm -hmm. they think that you should be doing so it massively impacts in that way but I suppose the other massive difference from the tv is I think we just touched on it before that you would see a CSI would, they'd get the call for the job, they'd go down there, they'd examine the scene, they'd interview all the witnesses, interview the suspects, then they'd go back to the lab, they'd get the lab coats on, they examine all the evidence and analyse it all. And then once they've got the fingerprints within two seconds, <laughs> yeah. they'll go out and uh, arrest someone and do the interviews and everything as well. And like Anne said earlier, it's just, it's just not like that. It's a massive team effort. So you won't do the police inside of it. You'll deal with the crime scene. So once the crime scene's been recorded, they know that's happened. You'll get called to go down and gather the forensic evidence. And then you will take it back. And if that needs to go off, you'll kind of look at what you have and what you think is going to get you best evidence. And then that will be sent off to a forensic scientist. We don't arrest anyone. Um, we don't, don't deal with that piece of it. Take names and no. get involved. No. no, and we don't get nice outfits either, do we, Ange? Not no. nice stilettos and suits and cool sunglasses. It's definitely glamorous. No, you drive around in a um, transit van and combats and t shirt, effectively. <laughs> nice combat and boots. White suits. You've got all <laughs> your personal protective equipment that you, that you put on for scene, so your white suits and hair nets and overshoes and gloves and masks. So it's not glamorous at all in the slightest, actually. And one of the other things I think as well that the TV does is, and they just touched upon it, is give results in super fast time. So people have an expectation of how quickly they'll get some DNA analysis, for instance, or fingerprint analysis. And it's just, it's, it's not, that, not that quick in real life. There are set kind of time frames and, um, policies that that you you follow so you're not going to get a dna result or a fingerprint result within 10 minutes and it's not just going to ping up and show you a suspect in all of their exact details and then zoom in and have a gps location <laughs> you wish <laughs> that you just round the corner from so you can pick them up straight away it just doesn't happen like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everything takes a bit more time right. just out of curiosity and a bit of a sidebar then is there is there any tv programs that represent crimes investigation in the right way or in a relevant way or is it all a little bit dramatic do you know we get asked this a lot as well we're not allowed to watch them this is a problem because we scream at the telly a lot so oh. we've been banned from watching them it's like no that would not happen that would never happen turn it off yeah, yeah. um just trying to think I'm trying to have a thing not that i can think of off the top of my head but because we try to avoid them, <laughs> to be honest. We're not allowed to watch them a lot of the time, like Ange says, so I'm trying to think of one. No, I mean, it's understandable. If it doesn't exist, then I, I would say there's a niche in the market, ladies. We'll think, uh, do a script. I think some of them are probably not as bad as... CSI is the worst one by far, and some of them aren't bad. Bits, bits will be accurate, but because it's so methodical and you're so careful about how you do everything that doesn't look very dramatic. So I think the try and drama size quite, quite a few bits of the TV, just to make it look that bit more dramatic and a bit more fun for the camera, really. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, lovely, thank you. Um, so what kind of, what can you tell us about the most, either the most famous scene you can, we've been on or the one that's really stuck with you for whatever reason? Hmm. That's a tricky one. I think that there are always certain jobs that stay with you and will stay with you for life. And I think that different things impact you in different ways as well. And sometimes you'd be dealing with, with your jobs and what you're doing. And you don't really realise that you've been impacted by something until weeks or a couple of months later and you realize that actually you're still thinking about it and processing it mm -hmm. and sometimes it might be something completely unexpected so um i'm trying to 
uh, for me, it was always um, if people were still living. So I found dealing with the dead sometimes easier because like Dee said earlier, interest takes over, um, you, you do your job, you process and scene, and you can almost remove some of that emotion hmm. to do your job. But when people are still living, so for instance, in um, serious assault cases or in abuse cases, um, then there's so much more emotion involved mm. and that when you see somebody else's emotion that kind of hits home at how real it is it kind of side swipes you out of your focus if that makes sense yeah yeah um, I'm presuming as well though if something did impact you like that then there's support available from the police force and, and everybody around you there is yeah it's good to have you most of the time you have a good team around you so you can talk to your to your colleagues and a lot of police forces offer um counseling and i think that they're even better these days than they were in, in back when when we were csis i think that that the counseling service provided is much much better and some forces um now have uh, an automatic policy in place where if you attend something um, what's the word? serious category why or something that could be traumatic then you automatically have to talk to a, okay. a counsellor or therapist so I think that the support out there is quite good for most forces these mm. these days mm -hmm. um, it's funny as well because I always found it um, strange if if I saw injuries on dead people then that was one thing but if I saw an injury on a living person and I'm not sure what it was but it used to turn my stomach <laughs> You can feel the pain, can't you? <laughs> yeah, it was. I remember I once went to a stabbing and I went to photograph the guy in hospital and he had a huge stab wound in his leg. And because of the swelling, they couldn't operate on him until the next day. So the wound was just open. It was down to the bone and I had to photograph it. And oh, and I was rocking on me on my feet because I was thinking... I'm going to pass out. <laughs> I was thinking, get grip, you're a professional CSI. <laughs> so he, was, he was still alive and you could feel his pain and you could see it. Oh, it was awful. So, yeah, I much prefer dealing with, um, it sounds terrible, much prefer dealing with dead people to live in sometimes. Oh, you had those experiences. Yeah. <laughs> hmm? I do, yeah. Yeah, I agree with Ange for the, the live, living injuries I found harder to deal with because I think it is like you say you can just you feel like ow more <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely yeah okay so that's 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 given me a lot of detail about kind of the 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 challenges in the job but what's the best thing about being a CSI do you think mm. for me it's that that no two days are the same that you get to be a part of a larger investigative process so that if you sometimes if you find a key piece of evidence that's going to help solve the crime that is so rewarding it feels it feels great um and that is a kind of scientific process but it's it's all about problem solving and being analytical you've got to be inquisitive and nosy and that really kind of fits my personality because i am pretty pretty nosy to be fair <laughs> <laughs> my mum said as a baby I always ask why 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 <laughs> so it works well <laughs> yeah I think this, the same as Ange with those things that um definitely the never knowing what's gonna happen and everything being different is really good and for me as well the um even though it can be hard sometimes dealing with victims in vulnerable states and when they're they're really distressed it that side of it's really rewarding as well to know kind of you've made a you've made a difference to someone and help them feel a bit better when they're maybe in a distressed state or just feeling a bit down it's it's good to be able to to help them particularly the vulnerable people you deal with I used to find it really rewarding dealing with the elderly elderly victims you know, obviously you feel absolutely dreadful for them for what's gone on but if you can just take a few minutes extra at that job to kind of put them at ease and just spend a few more minutes helping them then I think that side of it's really really rewarding as well. That's part of it as well isn't it is um, giving some crime prevention advice to people and um, 
just reassuring them and helping them because a lot of people fear that it's going to happen again mm. pretty quickly but actually the truth is it it doesn't happen so consecutively it's mm. really unfortunate if you if you were to be burgled for instance um a couple of times on the trot mm. within a short space of time so i think it's just about giving that kind of reassurance isn't it i remember i once went to um a burglary scene and I was fortunate because I didn't have that many jobs on that day. Um, and when I arrived, the guy was, he was blind. And so the intruders had been into his home, but also been around him. And he, he, he couldn't uh, do anything about it. He didn't know whether when they were moving quite quickly around him and confusing him. Mm-hmm. And it was just, he was in such an awful state. And his daughter who lived with him and took care of him was out at work. And so I spent, I ended up spending a good hour and a half with him and just sitting with him and making him a, after I'd done my job and got the evidence that I needed, of course. But <laughs> I talked him through everything that was happening and everything that I was doing. And I was kind of explaining where things were in the home, just to try and give him a bit of um, context, just so he knew, knew where things were because the trash stuff as well. So he wasn't even safe walking around because things weren't in the usual place and he tripped over a chair. So it was just like picking bits of furniture back up and putting some stuff back in, you know, just spending that time with him really. Yeah, like a human connection, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and that really? that's one that stayed with me because when I left, I felt heartbroken that, that, that another human could do that to someone. But at the same time, like Dee said, it was really rewarding in the fact that I'd got to spend that time with him and help him. By the time I left, he felt more at ease and he was reassured and he was more comfortable and he was okay with me leaving before his daughter got home even you know so it it is things like that I think that that have a big impact yeah and he'll massively appreciate that support as well coming from you know somebody on the other side of that uh situation that they're actually engaging with him on a on a personal level um I'm sure because I know um when I was growing up our house was burgled um and the uh investigator that came on that basically they'd come through our bathroom window which was teeny tiny like this and um I think I was about 12 and I'd said how did he get through there you know and he went oh some people if they can get their head through they can get in anywhere and that has haunted me for years now Aww. so <laughs> yes. absolutely the same um but no, I think the fact that uh, you do have that public engagement um, just kind of rounds off the, the impact of the work that you're doing. Um, so that's fantastic. And we get a lot from it as well as hopefully the, the victims of crime themselves get a lot from it. That's that's the hope. If you can leave somebody in a better, better place than where you started, then that's a good thing. Definitely. Do you get to find out then if, if um, you know, criminals are caught on and dealt with do you get to know that end stage of it as well when you've been at the beginning yeah Sometimes. so we will send the evidence off and normally that'll be recorded into police um, computer systems so if we were to get an identification on any of the evidence um that we'd recovered we'd get a notification about that um if we've not managed to get any evidence and somebody gets arrested through police investigation or the means, unless you keep up to date on the log on the reports yourself and keep checking back, you won't get notified because there's so much crime and so much going on that you, that you won't get notified. But if it's been through um, your evidence gathering and the evidence that you've sent up, then you will get notified. And one of the other key parts of um, being a scene investigator is attending court to give evidence. So you go and give evidence on what you've done at the scene and the evidence recovered and your processes. Um, and so particularly if you've got an identification, the chances are that you you might go to court to give evidence on that. So you need to be notified for that. So there are times that you do find out. I think that if you don't find evidence or forensic evidence that's going to drive the investigation, unless it's something that's had a big impact on you, like something like the case I was just telling you about, then you tend to just move on and get on with your other jobs. But if it is a case that's had an impact on you, you will keep checking the logs and check to see what the status is and if anyone's been arrested and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's really not just a, 
you don't automatically just get notified in in some cases hmm. so then, that makes sense <laughs> it did <Yeah>. yes <laughs> okay ladies um you might not be able to give specifics, but I'm just curious about what the funniest thing is you've maybe come across at a scene. Oh, Ooh. that's really tricky. This is, this is where it comes with yeah. to what you can tell us and what you can't as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, we have had some we've, we've had some good ones. I'm trying to think of one that's a bit more appropriate, but funny still. Um, I'm just thinking of one that the two of us went to actually, and it was a it was a criminal damage. So it's just a, a volume job that people don't tend to be that excited about going out to because there's usually not much to do. You normally do some photographs, and if you're lucky, there might be a few samples to take. And Angie and I got called to one, and it was a criminal damage where someone had broken you know the glass in interior kind of flat doors that go between the corridors so it was glass in there that had been broke and the log just said that glass had been broke they wanted us to take some photographs and see if we could see anything and it was quite quiet so we went along and had a look and when we got there we were like there's some blood there actually so perfect I and when you, see blood. <laughs> yeah, you get excited because you if they're on file, you pretty much know you're going to get a DNA profile, so it's a really good one. But inside the glass, it turned out it looked like someone had punched the glass and it had broke it. But, you know, the security glass where it has the metal running through it, the metal grid, so it keeps it together. So the metal grid was still in place and they'd cut themselves on that and was getting a, a sample of the glass and swabbing the blood. And then we're looking and we could see something on top of the glass and we were like, what is that? So as you do, took the photographs and then picked it up and had it on gloved hand, thankfully, <laughs> and was looking at it thinking, what is that? And then we eventually realised it was some money that took the, the end of the knuckle off. So the whole skin from the knuckle. So it was just a knuckle, like not, obviously not the bone, but the knuckle skin, the whole thing had just sliced off and it was just lying on the floor on top of the glass. So... Mm -hmm. We thought it was a bit funny because it was just it was just unusual. It's not often you just see someone's whole knuckle lying there, particularly at a job like criminal damage where you think it's just going to be something little. So that was quite an interesting one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a good one. <laughs> I can imagine when you, it dawns on you what it was. We you'd have to probably inspect it quite closely as well, wouldn't you, to have <laughs> that? Yeah, like, um, what is that? Yeah, it was <laughs> it's something. I don't know if this is funny or gruesome. I think funny for my teammates, a bit traumatic for me. Funny in the end, it wasn't um, wasn't seriously traumatic, but I was once at a post-mortem and I was the photographer. And um, in post-mortems, they look at the skull and the brain. And um, we were at a stage where we were looking at the skull and there was a hole in the top and something that resembled like a cyst was kind of popping out. And everybody was really interested because they're like, oh, that's a bit unusual. What's, what's that? And the pathologist was like, oh, I'm going to have to take a sample of this because it's, it, it is quite unusual to see something sprouting out. And so we all got a bit closer. And um, then I got even closer still and was just about to take a photograph when the pathologist cut in to take a sample. <laughs> it's like burst in a huge spot and pus just kind of burst out from it and flew across the mortuary and then straight down onto my face which was disgusting uh, <laughs> but it kind of you know when something happens in slow motion so I'm looking and then I see it and I start moving back in slow motion and the rest of the team around me is like in slow motion going it <laughs> 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 landed on me and the uh, yeah, there was a lot of laughter. <laughs> not not so much from me initially. <laughs> no, no, I can imagine. I mean, that, that that's gruesome and funny. Yeah, so well done. Um, yeah, went along and kind of scrubbed my face and then came back into the room and was like, okay, let's get on. But it, it spread around the depot pretty quickly. So when <laughs> I got back from the hospital, <laughs> I walked in and colleagues were like, hey, you've had... Uh, 
brain juice. Nice way of putting it. So we've had surprise brain, brain juice and a knuckle flap. Um, I mean, you're definitely colouring the picture in, ladies. <laughs> Do you know what? I'm trying to think of something. We're, we're saying funny to all these gruesome things. And um, I told you you need a dark sense of humour. You develop a dark sense of humour. I'm trying to think of something that doesn't have a gruesome that was funny. I know. Because I was just going to give another funny story, but it, it involves a body again. So <laughs> it's got an element of gruesomeness in it again. Um, it was one I was in the, the mortuary and I was having to take fingerprints from a body for identification. Because it's another thing that we have to do if there's a body and we don't know who they are. We'll take fingerprints from them to run through the system to see if we can identify them that way. And I was I was working getting these fingerprints. I was supposed to be working with someone, but went off and left us to do it by myself. <laughs> and we normally work with someone because it's much easier when the when the hands are kind of folded over. You, you you've got a method that you can kind of massage the, the ligaments and things, and it'll help to open the hand out. But you need to kind of keep pressure on, and it helps keep the hand open. So I'd managed to do it myself, and I had the hand open. And as I leant over to get my kit to take the fingerprints. My finger slipped off the off where it was keeping the pressure and the hand sprang back shut <laughs> onto my thumb and it had a really good grip there. <laughs> so I absolutely screamed the mortuary down frantically trying to get my thumb out as the mortuary technician and everybody come running in to see what was going on and I was white as a sheet trying to get it out. So um, yeah, that was a that was a that quite was a funny one. Funny. Everybody else found that more funny than me in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay I've got a couple of others for you actually actually Dion you should tell your story about the bus I'm just going to avoid that one thanks <laughs> <laughs> so this one isn't so much a crime scene one um it's Another thing when you're out and about, you, you keep an eye out on kind of what's going on. And quite often you can come across things happening that you have to ring in yourself and report. And I was out and I actually had an attachment with me. So you take police officers are out who are doing training as well. And I had someone out with me and um, we, we were pulled up and I seen someone in a bus stop and they're acting a bit, a bit strange and they're carrying something. And we're looking and looking and I was like, oh my God, they've got a gun. And I thought they had a shotgun over their arm. <laughs> a bit unusual walking down in Sunderland. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, oh my God. So we're, we're keeping an eye out. And then the officer who was with us as well actually thought it was as well. So we're like, okay, we need to keep an eye. We'll ring it into the control room. So we're on the radio, rang it in. And they're like, just don't approach, just stay a safe distance. Keep an eye though. And keep her informed someone's coming down so they sent the unit out <laughs> the person boards the bus <laughs> and then they send the patrol down which stops the bus gets on only to find out it was a fishing rod <laughs> so this poor guy the bus had got stopped by a patrol car the police all get on the bus and this poor guy had a fishing rod and I'd reported him thinking he had a fire on. <laughs> but it was your duty. You did the right thing. I, did, so I didn't, like, didn't get into trouble or anything like that because it was a genuine concern and thought it was really happening. So I'd rather that you did report it than you don't report it and actually turns out it was a gun. But yeah. I did not live that down for quite some time. <laughs> no, I don't know, actually. They'll bring it up, clearly. <laughs> yeah. Ange loves that story, don't you? Oh, I do, yeah. That's brilliant. <laughs> Uh, they're all coming back to me now I'm just thinking of another one uh, where they went on an, a drugs raid and um, <laughs> the police had got there and used the, uh, I can't remember what it's called eh? can you the battering ram the battering ram thing, yeah, battering ram thing to, to break the door down and um, there, there was a couple living in this house and the the wife had just been in the bath and she'd been letting the water out and when the husband heard the police coming he'd just been weighing out his drugs in the bedroom so he grabbed the drugs and he ran to the bathroom and he was trying to get rid of them so he's opening the bags and the the plug had fallen back into the bath so there was just like a gooey paste 
of drugs. So he couldn't get rid of it for starters, but then he pulled the bag and it burst open and it just absolutely covered him from head to waist. He looked like a snowman, but he was also <laughs> then quite high. <laughs> so when I arrived, he was in his living room, um, chained to handcuff to another police officer and I got asked to photograph him in his living room while I walked in and naturally I was very professional but it was hard actually to really keep <laughs> it look just kind of stood only in his shorts box of shorts looking very sad and sorry for himself because he's just been caught with a rather large drug haul and then is also absolutely covered as well that one was um that one was funny <laughs> and another one Okay, the last one because they are coming back now. That's <laughs> you kind of getting in the kind of start coming back in floods when you when you start. Uh, another one it was. Uh, do you remember I was in the mortuary day? I'd gone to do a post mortem, and uh, yeah. we'd gone into the mortuary, and there was a few bodies out, and then also funeral directors were bringing in a couple of other bodies because post mortems take place in hospital mortuaries, and the, there are forensic areas. Um, but obviously other normal hospital mortuary stuff goes on and hospital post-mortems and stuff. Um, so there were more bodies coming in from the funeral directors and there were a couple already out. And then the person that we'd come to look at was also out. And um, the, the team had had a bit of a conversation and my manager turned around and said, okay, we're going to go and look at some CCTV and we're going to put a strategy in place. Are you okay to set the room up? set the kit up and, and you know get get ready for whatever and I was like yeah no no problem at all and it wasn't a problem everybody left including um the, the mortuary manager and so I was on my own in the mortuary which doesn't normally bother me but I'm getting I was getting ready and I'm putting my personal protective equipment on and I'm pulling my, my overseat on and I just did way nice so kind of looked around and I was thinking that's weird. And I just thought, oh, it's probably just in your mind, you know, picture in that environment, sometimes your brain starts playing tricks on you. And I just thought, obviously, been in lots of mortuaries, get on with it. So here I carry on getting ready and I just hear, so I'm like, okay, what is that? Really, what is it? And I started to get a little bit, <laughs> what's the word? <laughs> not panicky, but my brain started working overtime, thinking, I'm not sure I like this. <laughs> I like being in here on my own at this point so I carried on getting ready and it happened again so I thought that's it I'm out of here so I started leaving towards the office where everybody else was and that, that the mortuary manager was walking back in and he's like you're right and I was like yeah yeah I'm good he's like a bit you look a bit pale are you okay and I thought I'm stood there and I'm processing thinking do I say anything or do I just and I was like oh yeah I'm fine he's like where are you going and I was like, nowhere nowhere I'm I'm all right. I'm staying here now. You're here, and he's like, "What's the matter with you?" And I said, "Oh, honestly, I said I don't know what it is, but something keeps making a funny noise, and it just I just wasn't keen." <laughs> he started laughing. So I carried on getting ready, and then he couldn't stop laughing because I just heard it again. And I was like, "Mick, that's it. There it is." And he's like, "You silly bugger! <laughs> it's basically it's the air freshener." So every time I move. <laughs> Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was one of the bodies. <laughs> it's where your mind goes, isn't it? Yeah, it would in there. Yeah, I'd be no good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there's quite a lot of funny things. I'm sure there's a million more we could tell. Yeah. And to be fair, not me and Dave, we could chat about it all day as well. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just love what you've managed to tell us today, to be honest, because. Uh, yeah, it's definitely piqued my interest and mm -hmm. I, I'm going to be asking for more of those stories, no doubt, off camera. So, <laughs> Anytime. prep those little gems, <laughs> ladies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> okay, then. So to, to kind of bring it all together, is there, a, is there any advice you can give any, any students who are considering becoming a CSI? Um, I guess I would say we know it's a yes and we know mm. <laughs> head's gone blank it depends on um at what level so for degree students if they're interested in um seed investigation it's just about 
um, basically getting yourself ahead of the game. Actually, this applies for everyone. Have yeah. a sign, have some sign, kind of scientific background because best, um, it's best if you understand the science behind what you're doing and why you're doing it. So you, that scientific background really helps you know what you're going to get from that piece of evidence, if that makes sense. So having a scientific background is good. Having a photographic background is really good because you've got to be able to work your way around a camera and be technical, technically competent. Um, but the other thing is, is do things to get yourself ahead of the game. So um, volunteer, volunteer in anything really that, that that's related. So you could be a special constable for the younger kids, join police cadets or army cadets. Um, when I was a student, I volunteered in victim support in the witness service. So there's lots of different areas that you can volunteer in that will give you experience that will kind of put you ahead of the game for when you're going into those interview, interview processes or application processes. And the other thing is, is you're not always going to work, walk straight into your dream job. And crime scene and forensic investigation is a very competitive field. So it, you've got to do those things to put your head of the game but the other thing is is think more about the kind of things that you're going to apply for because sometimes it's easy to get a job in an organization and move over than what it is walking straight into your dream job so if you don't walk straight into your dream job don't be disheartened but think about the bigger picture and the bigger scope when you're applying for stuff because there's loads of different jobs out there that that can help progress you towards scene investigation if that's really what you want to do or forensic science if that's really what you want to do but there's also lots of other investigative careers out there that are really interesting as well so just off the top of my head um custody investigation officers uh they interview people in in custody and gather evidence from suspects um there are um i'm saying there's loads and then my mind's just gone blank um coroner's investigation officers so working as a coroner's officer there's jobs in um victim support there's also jobs uh in the court services there's jobs in you can be a civilian police investigator now you don't always have to be a police officer you can do civilian police investigation roles mm -hmm. detention officer there's there's so many different jobs out there mm -hmm. that if you just kind of widen the net it gives you that experience to then take it towards your dream job because like I say it is a highly competitive field if people think they're going to walk straight into a job it, I think that it can be disheartening when that doesn't happen but yeah. if you keep at it and keep going it, you know it will it will happen for you I think just I think and it's just got pretty much everything in there I think the only other thing I would add is those skills that we were talking about earlier um, people can get those skills through so many other jobs from whatever you've done in the in the past. So my very first job, I worked in Primark and then I worked as a doctor's receptionist in the NHS. But being able to say that I had work experience where actually it's public facing. So actually I've got great communication skills. So anything like that, any jobs that you currently have, think about the skills and even courses so your degree course you'll be delivering presentations you'll be working to deadlines so not just don't just think about I've got the course or I've worked in I've worked wherever it may be but actually it's not relevant it's all relevant if you think about those skills that we've talked about and actually address them and show how you've used them then that's really useful as well yeah because employers love examples so if you can take one of those skills, like Dee says, from your degree or from a part-time job that you're using to get you through your studies or volunteer experience, but you get asked a question in an interview and you can show how you've got that skill and why you've used it and give an example, then you'd be laughing. That's where people, people are really looking. The other thing that I think is really important to say at the minute as well is for people to keep an eye on um, ISO standards because that is just changing significantly at the moment in crime scene and forensic investigation and crime scene investigators are now passing, having to pass competency tests. So to be aware of what's going on in forensics and the ISO standards and keep an eye on that, um, it's something that's at the fore, so, so people will be 
asked about it in interview in, in particular, I would think mm -hmm. currently that probably won't be the same going forward, but um, it's important to be aware of those kinds of things and what's going on to keep yourself current and relevant. So that's another thing, actually, join some societies like the Chartered Society of Forensic Sciences is a great one. They run lots of conferences. They do lots of stuff for students. They have lots of publications, um, events, usually not in pandemic times, but where there's face-to-face -face stuff going on. So, you know, join an organisation such as the Chartered Society to keep yourself up to date with what's relevant and what's going on in the forensic arena. Okay. It's really important because there's developments all the time. Mm -hmm. And if you keep abreast of that and show that in, again, in interviews and applications, people, I think employers like that. I think that's some sound advice there. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Thank you, ladies, for, for answering those questions today. Um, I'm sure if anybody has any questions, they can get in touch with you uh, through CSI training and events. Is that OK? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fine. If anybody would like any more information or would like us to talk to anybody, then get in touch and uh, drop us a line and we'll be happy to do so. And thank you, Emma. No problem. Thanks for talking to us today. And uh, hopefully we have a, a new generation of crime scene investigators coming off the back of this. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.